Oh, I don't see myself yet. Maybe in a say Hey, look at it. There's me. Hello, weirdos and mellow folks. Uh, I'm Doug, uh, also known as Guslato. Uh, on the forums and on the Discord and all over the place, uh, and Top Doug Designs as well. And I am here to continue painting for you today. Uh, unfortunately, when last we left, uh, our intrepid counterfeit Kevin here, my power went out and everything stopped happening. So those issues have been sorted. Uh, we've made sure that Waldo was properly fed today and all is well. And I've got backup in case the, you know, he decides to get an escape and chew on cables again. Anyway, let's dive right in. I'm gonna throw on my painting glasses because magnification is always our friend. So, with Kevin here, I think first thing I want to do is he's got a little bit of a shirt in there that I uh, was going to give him a whitish shirt. So I would like to go in and add a little bit more highlights to that. Just kind of do on the inside there before we get too much. And, you know, we're going to risk bumping things when we uh, get to that. So here we go. Put a little bit on there. For those not familiar with it, I use the Reaper MSP paints because I like them. I like their uh, consistent translucency. And um, when you see me drop it, set in with this bottle. This is the Lamian Medium from Citadel. It's a matte medium. I love using it for thinning. It's uh, how I work. To, I paint with uh, more or less glazes. So let's test that. That's oh, a little bit too thin. So how is everyone doing today? Hope everyone had a nice weekend. I had a good time. There we go. That is literally just those couple of drops there was all I needed for that shirt. I was going to go with the next. Hey, we got Learguard in here. Good to see you, man. Baby no sleep, otherwise okay. And I'm assuming this is the the app Learguard. App dude, right? You are kind of my hero. Because quite frankly, that app has changed the way I play in a, you know, very good way that being able to have instantly at uh, my fingertips a reference for everything just speeds everything up. I love it so much. And I also love that you're super active in the community because it shows that you care and you're super responsive anytime there's an issue. I know it's gonna get fixed. And I bet you've got a whole bunch of uh, work ahead. I mean, there's a bunch of, you know, new stuff coming up. So you've got more work coming down the pipeline here pretty soon. So that's always exciting. 
looking forward to seeing how uh, Now I'm looking forward to seeing how titles end up being implemented inside the app. Because that's going to be, you know, an interesting implementation because it's not just swapping out the art on the uh, card there because the backs are different. So that's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, can confirm, neither confirm nor deny. But I'm so not based off of what you're seeing there, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to be, uh, the titles are going to be implemented into the app. Which those of you who, if you're not keeping up to date on what's going on in Malifaux releases, some interesting challenges with the data structure. Oh yeah, I can I can only imagine. I've done some video game dev stuff, and uh, well, I've only done the art side of it. I've seen what uh, programmers do, and quite frankly, that takes next level thinking as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, so I was saying, and so those who are not familiar with what's been going up on with the, uh, in the world of Malifaux, uh, Weird has announced that all of the masters are now getting their titles, which that's something that um, the concept of titles has been in the uh, third edition rule book since you know it's launched there, but we haven't actually seen them implemented in a way that actually did anything. The only master who had a title before was uh, Lucas McCabe, but it didn't um, actually uh, change anything with him because it was just uh, mounted hunter and dismounted or something like that. And so that was really the only difference there. But so now it'll be really cool uh, to uh, see all of the different play styles that uh, these, man these titles put into effect. And uh, something really cool that the good people over at Weird has been doing is so along with, you know, how we're doing all this painting here. This is, you know, something new that uh, we decided to try out, and I'm loving painting for you all so far, is that they have been teasing the new releases of the titles with various content creators. Uh, you know, Third Floor War, Steve Power Scoundrels, um, there's a lot of them. Those are the two that popped in my head off the top of my bit. Uh, there, there's so many. There's too many of them for me to name. But they've got a link to all of these reveals and to all the content that these content, these awesome content creators have been putting out. Um, Kyle, if you're listening, if you could drop that link to the uh, content, uh, the uh, upcoming content thing that all of the uh, content creators have been putting out. That would be awesome. Because it's just such cool stuff. And I'm excited to see all the things. And they're doing it. Yep, there we go. That's what uh, Kyle's got it there. And what they've got there is, so all of the masters are getting titles. And the way it looks like, at least from what we've seen so far, what it looks like is being released is that there's going to, oh, uh, next Friday is The Other Coast. Nice. Uh, gameplay, I'm gonna... <laughs> yeah, that is quite amusing. Of course, anytime I listen to Steam Powered Scoundrels, it really throws me because uh, the, the uh, Doug from Steam Powered Scoundrels, not only is it Doug, so anytime I hear some, they say, Doug, I'm like, what? Are they talking to me? Totally throws me. But Doug's last name, he's Doug Broman. I am Doug Bowman. And yes, that has caused confusion many different places. Honestly, it causes confusion at least once a month. And it 
tickles me to no end. But so all things, so they're doing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we really, you know, it, uh, he might be coming down to Gen Con. So if he shows up at Gen Con, because I'm going to be at Gen Con. If he comes down to Gen Con, him and I are going to have to have a dug off. To be fair, I have no clue what a dug off would all entail. But, you know, that, then we'll, we'll figure it out. Or a Bowman Broman off. I'm not sure. Not sure. Bromanov. That sounds like his Russian cousin. But so anyway, before I got distracted on all that there. So the way it looks like they're from what I've seen so far, and I'm gonna doesn't I don't like the sound of a dug off. We'll do a Bowman Bromanov. to determine who gets to own the last name, maybe. I don't know. But the... Um, way it looks like they are releasing uh, these masters is that there is... Uh, so the way they've been showing all of these reveals so far is they're showing two different masters, each with their new title, and then a extra, um, usually like it's a minion or an enforcer. I think all of them have been minions or enforcers so far. I don't think there's been a henchman. But a minion or enforcer that shares keywords with both of them. So the one I was super excited about on Friday was they did um, Lord Cooper, and his keyword is Apex, and they did Marcus, whose keyword is Chimera. And then they also shared and showed an eagle, I think the Empyrean eagle, that is um, Apex, and Chimera. So that was really exciting. Okay, so no no henchmen so far. So yeah, I know there's been some enforcers and some minions. But I was super excited about that combo there because that is an instant buy box for me because Marcus is one of my all-time favorite masters. Plus, I've been playing a lot of Lord Cooper lately. Because I just love the concept of him, you know, hunting the deadliest game. So, I'm very excited for that box there. Plus, the, the other cool thing, so the gamer in me is excited for new ways to play masters that I already love. The painter in me, which is what you're turning in to watch today, loves that. And this was a big surprise for me. Yeah, all the. Uh, that's a really big surprise for me. Was that they are bringing out models for each of these titled masters. And I was not expecting that at all. Oh, that, yeah, Boomstick, that would be really cool if he were able to swap between them like Vogel. I think gameplay-wise, that could be uh, insanely broken if he swapped between his, you know, if he could swap between his titles like Vogel, that would be insane. And um, I'd be here for it, you know. Kyle, if you're listening, give us a way to do that. that I, I, I would love that. But that's, you know, wish listing insane things. But I'm, I'm psyched that they are bringing out models to go with all these titles. 
I originally thought of oh, Creepy Children Nexus is up there as one of your favorite pivots. Yes. Malfo always needs more creepy children. Apparently, Malifo is made up of uh, mostly creepy children and spider people. Ooh, I wonder if we're getting more spider people. I'd love more spider people. Go hang out with, you know, Widow Weaver and the Bandersnatch. Who I've been really loving the Bandersnatch lately. He's my boy. Or girl. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. All right. I think that red is looking good there. You know what? I think I'm going to add a little bit of detail on that money there. It's just going to be a little bit weird. So I'm going to go. And which color would probably... Yeah. Leather brown's gonna work well for that. Yeah, yeah. I trust me. Anything fun for Marcus, I am here for. I uh, Marcus is pretty much one of my all-time favorite masters. But I love that they are having models for each of these new titles. I originally thought it was just gonna be an alternate stat card. But no, it's full on different models, which just makes me so very, very happy. And uh, if you haven't seen it, the uh, new Marcus model is, I've been referring to him as Beast Mode Marcus. Halfway through, clear. So I before second edition hit, I had I mean before third edition hit, I had collected the faction, almost the entire faction that is Marcus, because he used to be able to hire all of the beasts, like literally every single beast, and that meant I had I was like I need every beast in case I want to hire them in sometime. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to add in, so I'm looking at the money, so here we go, grabbing my reference. Just kind of seeing what the money looks like there. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of freehanding of some money here. Because I want to add a little bit of extra detail here. So I'm just adding kind of a little brown splotch to the middle of each of them. Kojo, Cerberus, Crockett, Oh, I just finished painting um, Crockett uh, last week. So if you go to my Instagrams, uh, Top Doug Design on Instagram, you can check out my um, how I painted uh, my Crockett, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. Yeah, no more Don Serpent. I love Don Serpent with. Uh, Mr. Marcus there. So I finished up uh, over last week, I ended up finishing up the um, Bird order initiate. I already had Snick Boy order initiate. Then I did the finished up Bird order initiate and Paul Crockett. So I've never run all three order initiates at the same time. So Rhino order initiate is probably going to sit uh, just primed and unpainted for a little while because uh, he's my least favorite one. But Bird and Snake Boy are my favorites. I 
I didn't used to like them a lot, but then when they draw, when they got eroded to a low, I, for painting, I love them. Uh, when they got eroded to be a lower cost, that really sold it for me. Also, I totally misread, had been misreading Chimera, the uh, Chimera Strike trigger on them, where they, I thought it was, they had to have that number of upgrades on them themselves. I'm like, they can only get one per turn and they're discarding them to get things. I was like, oh no, it's for upgrades nearby them. And that meant, oh wow, that's a whole lot better. And this is why we read the cards. But yeah, so anyone who hasn't checked out the new um, reveal from today, go check that out. Uh, Kyle shared the link a little bit ago. I can't remember which content creator it was who uh, got to do the unveil. But the uh, masters they unveiled are Mei Feng, and finally, Bayou got a little bit of love, other than Zoraida. And we got Mecha Me Mama Tucket. A oh, rage quit. Okay, cool. I haven't listened to their podcast yet. I've heard good things. I need to give them a listen. I tend to be kind of terrible at keeping up on podcasts. Uh, I usually save up the... Um, Save them up until I can listen to like three or four of them in a row. Which I do that all the time with the uh, Breach Eye broadcast. The, which uh, anyone who's not familiar with the Breach Eye broadcast, oh my gosh. Uh, I, that is my all-time favorite podcast. Because it goes through all of the lore of Malifaux. From way back, you know, first edition... You know, all the way up into, we're into basically current stuff. Hey, what's up? We got, yay. Thank you for liking the stream, Adam John. Ooh, a live, uh, I've got a live, uh, wait, I liked the stream. I did that earlier. That's weird and awkward. But yeah, before, uh, I've got a live Vagrant song, Learn to Play Thursday. Oh, that would be, oh, with Third Floor Wars. Good times. I like them. Yeah, Vagrant Song is a really, really cool game. All right, so let's see. Tan skin. Yep, time for some tan skin here. Get onto his skin. That'll be fun. What time is that on Thursday? Oh, yeah, Boomstick. That'd be really, really cool to make it all look all abandoned and stuff. 8 p.m. Eastern. Okay. I'll probably be a little late tuning into that. A Thursday night is Malifaux night for me at the local game store. And, well... I need to get my gaming fix in. Here we go. Paint those legs. 
So this is we named this guy Counterfeit Kevin, but his nickname, the story behind him, is that he's also nicknamed Chicken Legs Charlie, but he hates that name. So he tries to go by Counterfeit Kevin, but all the people who know him from back when he was a kid know him as Chicken Legs Charlie, because dude's got chicken legs. Because quite frankly, if I'm going to be painting these guys and talking about them at length, I've got to give them names. Hey, thanks for tuning in, Johnny Gadfly. I'm glad you're finally able to catch me. I'm very elusive. I mean, oh. Awesome. That's a fun little group. Oh, yeah, I forgot to post this there, too. <laughs> so many places to post and tell people what we got going on. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with what this model is, this is one of the Hucksters. from the One Born Every Minute box, the Wastrel keyword. So these guys love to hang out with Lucas McCabe. So this is the third of them, and I should get this guy pretty much finished up today. Yeah, this guy's, gonna, this guy's pretty close to done, honestly. Hey, Virak, good to see you, man. Yeah, yeah, so this guy, his friends, are also, we got Ol Randall, who is the first mini I painted up on stream, and we got Alkaline Agatha. So these are, uh, yeah, scheme pools. Yeah, yeah, they are a priority to take down. But also, they're awesome models. I love these models. These are some of the most characterful uh, models in the game, and I love it. All righty, so I'm gonna, I got his hair a little bit highlighted there. I mean, his face, I'm gonna go and do a little bit of work on his hair, which, yeah, I think that's the one I need there. Yep, all righty. So yeah, we're at the point where we are doing the details on him. So it's kind of, I end up bouncing around between a lot of the details. Just because it's, you know, you know, do, you know, two touches here, two touches there, and move on. And then two touches here, two touches there, and move on. Because at this point, there's not a lot to left to paint on him. 
Let's add a little bit more of that. These are just, these are just fun little guys to paint because they just got so much fun detail there. Okay. I was going in and um, just highlighting the hair. Figured make him give him blonde hair. Struck me as a Nice look for him there. Okay. Up a little bit there. So what's everyone else painting right now? Yeah, they are just full of want Oh, yeah, yeah, I gotta make sure, you know, I gotta have some variation in it there. New Nephilim, nice. I need to paint mine up at some point. I've got all of Nakima's friends built up. Right. Yeah, that's how it goes. There, the painting never ends. Uh, isn't that the way it goes? It's one of the reasons um, I've got. So these two, they are finished. You can tell. So I always I sign the bottom of my minis and uh, put the date on them when I finish them. But if I'm painting uh, models to go with uh, the same crew. I end up liking to keep them nearby so I can make sure that they fit together, but also that they uh, don't look exactly the same. So I wanna make sure that that red, that I'm kind of tying through the crew. You see the red is the uh, that spot, that color that's kind of tying them all together. And so I wanna make sure that I paint the red up to about the same red, but I don't want them to look exactly the same. So it's that together but different. All righty. So I think I need to. Yeah. So I'm going to go back and tap those. Mm 
little bit of money. Turn that brown into more of a parchment color there. So I put down the brown first so that I'm not putting down this really thin white thing here. Dual keyword. Oh, yeah. Yep, DUA and Syndicate. I haven't been, uh, I haven't gotten syn the Syndicate models yet other than Rook. So haven't decided how I'm going to paint them. I think, I mean, because they are, the story behind the Syndicate is got stuff going, they're kind of taking over the railroad operations in Malifaux now, right? Unless I'm mistaken. Thunder Rails had a majority control, but they want more. Okay, cool. So I was thinking I might end up putting them on railroad bases, which I need to, you know, come up and determine how I'm going to do that. Hey, thank you for liking the screen, the, the stream there. Me words good. Um, oh, goodness. Where'd that go? As I close things out. There we go. Scoot in this way. So yeah, th uh, that means I kind of think I want to put them onto a railroad base. But I haven't figured out what I need to do to make that railroad base look great. All right, so those boots there need some. His boots need something. So yeah, I think I'm going to go with these. Well, one of the things I tend to do is um, I'm, a, I'm a sculptor. And so like the, the bases for all three of these models here are uh, things I sculpted and then 3D printed them. So it's one of the things I like to do. So I can base it, if I want a custom base, I just jump onto my computer, spend a little bit of time in there, sculpt it, and then, you know, 30 minutes to an hour later, pop it off my printer. Ooh, I'd love a, I, I would love a laser cutter, but I don't have a place for one right now. but I do have five 3D printers. I do a lot of uh, terrain stuff with them. Since I run a lot, ah, gonna get a Glowford one. Nice, yeah, I just don't have some place to uh, ventilate the, um, the smoke from that. Yeah, I guess so let's go in and land this in a little bit better. Because his boots were looking a little splotchy. They are dirty and they're leather, so it's kind of going in. Like I've got my um resin printer set up in a, a unused guest bathroom. So 
that I can ventilate properly. But there's no room in that same bathroom for a laser cutter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, see, that wouldn't fly. So my wife's working from home right now. And by right now, I mean, she's been, you know, working from home for over a year, like much of the country. And her uh home office is set up in our master bedroom which is right off of the master bathroom so um that wouldn't fly and uh would make her very very cranky and i like to keep my wife happy <laughs> all righty so i'm gonna go i believe it's time to do you know what? let's do the big bits time to do the leather cloak here Yeah, I mean, uh, she gave, gave me a lot of um, grief over that, being that uh, I've taken, uh, you can only see uh, on my camera here, you can only see a uh, portion of my office, but I've got a, my office up here, I've got a table with four 3D printers on there. <laughs> and a gigantic eight-foot-long table for those printers. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you've seen that. So I've got, you know, my evil genius layer here. All right, is this what I need? Yep, that is, in fact, the color I need for this. Next, so yeah, Marcus was the one that I was really, really excited about. And the fact that he uh, is sharing the model with um, Cooper, that made my that made my week last week. And is that is what I'm most excited for. But the next key the next keyword I'm excited for, I really want to see what you do with what's going on with uh rasputina because rasputina was my first master marcus was my second master and unfortunately right now i'm not playing i am not playing rasputina very much her third edition play style just doesn't fit the way i end up playing most of the time I mean, we've all got those 
various play styles that work best for us. And third edition Rasputina so far hasn't been hitting that sweet spot for me. Ooh, yes, Mecha, Mecha Mima is so cool. I'd love to see Wong. Um, Wong is one of those masters who... I, I don't tend to play... Okay, I, I've never played as Bayou. They don't play, like I was saying, with um, Rashby there. They're just sometimes play styles that don't fit you as a player. And... The silliness of the gremlins doesn't really fit the way I play. And I'd like to think they started with a logic puzzle of shared model concept and then had to. Oh, that that would be that'd be fun. That would be fun to. Uh... See how the sausage was made. Well, after, you know, ply Matt and Kyle with beer at uh, Gen Con and find out all of their secrets to how they designed it all. Isolate them, you know, get, make sure uh, Kelly is distracted, then feed uh, Kyle and Matt lots of beer at Gen Con, and they'll spill all of the secrets when Kelly's not looking. <laughs> Pepe Silva. But yeah, so I'd love uh, I'd love to see Wong. Uh, I painted. Uh, looks like uh, I need to up your web security. They know too much. <laughs> uh, I love. Uh, so, a couple years during the last Iron Painter competition, I uh, ended up using the Wong box for a for uh, two different dioramas. I used um, well. What, what's his name? The the guy, the the wrestler guy. I can't remember his name. Uh, Mancha Roja, Mancha Roja. I used Mancha Roja and all of the wrestlers for a fun little. Um, So for uh, that, yeah, so I used the Mancha Roja and a bunch of, um, and all the wrestlers for a bi wrestling match. Uh, thing that was tons of fun to uh, build and paint. And that's currently living at my local game store in their painting case. Because the guy there wanted to, uh, it's like, hey, I'd love to put that in the paint on display here. So it's currently living there at uh, Dragon's Lair, Houston. Yeah, yeah, I think I called it a uh, good, clean, fun. And I hope at some point we get the. Uh, Iron Painter competition going again, because quite frankly, I love painting for that. And one of the things I really enjoy about that is that you can, you know, show off what you're doing. And if uh, we get Iron Painter going again, hey, I'll probably paint some of that on the stream here, because that'll be fun. But so I did, um, 
that for one diorama. Then in a later round, I painted up Wong, built a stage for Wong, and I've got it where he's um, sawing the lovely assistant, which I know she's got a name now, but I still only know her as the lovely assistant. Um, doing a, you know, levitating her, did a saw her in half and was levitating her above the stage. And you've got the, uh, I've got the um, lightning bugs off on the side of the stage, you know, pulling on the, uh, the ropes to pull it up. And so it's the, he's doing a magic trick on some stage magic. And it, it's just was tons of fun to paint. And I love doing stuff like that. And every year, as a uh, every year that they've done that, whenever I did did uh, Iron Painter, every year I leveled up my painting. So, and I did love it when they started doing it. Where the um, first round it was a seating round. So first year got the uh, first year that they did that, I got seated into the bronze tier. Um, but ended up being, um, then the next year I ended up being a bronze final. Um, no, I, I can't remember. I ended up uh, being one of the finalists for bronze tier one year. I got silver year and then I got silver, one of the finalists in silver tier one year, which was lots of fun. I'd have to, I, I've got it written down somewhere, but ultimately it was just always a challenge to come up with something really cool to do and then execute it really quickly. And one of the things with, oh, glad you took inspiration from that for your wrestling basis. But one of the really fun things about that was that most of the time, the because with the iron painter you had to paint it up in you had two weeks to do it so a lot of the time it was the i had to paint what i had at hand or see what my local shop had in stock because ordering something you never know if it's going to get uh held up in the postage And so painting competitions like that, I love because then I'm also not painting to put it on the tabletop. I like to paint things that have no useful purpose whatsoever. They're never going to hit the tabletop. They're going to live in my in a display case as a diorama. I love doing dioramas. Because then it, you just get freedom and you can tell a story with it. And honestly, when it comes to um, basing miniatures, I also kind of, when I can, like to go with a, I view uh, miniature bases, uh, the bases, as kind of, you know, little mini dioramas. There's a chance for your model to tell a story. And speaking of story, one of the other things. Oh, what we got there? Uh, so, yes, they really do. They, um, 
Weird miniatures are just such they're dynamic with uh, exciting poses. Now that does lend to, you know, time, when you get the tiny little bits there, you, that, that leads to Jan Lowe's beard situations. But ultimately, worth it. Worth it for how cool and dynamic everything is. Awesome. So, oh, God. Yeah, I can see that. So, one of the model kits that has been sitting unbuilt in my uh, on my uh, in my cabinet of shame for a couple years now was the crazy cat lady uh, nightmare box which I've heard is a nightmare to build so I've just never gotten around to building it should do that one of these days. I really want to play my crazy cat, the cat, crazy cat lady at some point. I mean, I play mostly, you know, I play mostly Arcanist and Neverborn, but now I also happen to do a lot of Explorer Society because new, fun, exciting. But I'm always building, I'm always painting. Uh, blue needs a his blue pouch there needs a little bit more on it. Yeah, always be painting.
Alrighty. Right before I mess things up, it's time to just do the eyes. I know it's the worst because this guy's eyes are actually large enough to do. Ooh, what are you doing there? My black paint got on. Guess it's time to do a little bit on his boots there, which I did. Chestnut gold on his boots. Well, that means Palomino gold is the next one up there. This guy is really close to finished. Really doing the fine detail, getting down to the fine details now. And these boots I haven't really highlighted much yet. So this is the more larger details. But other than that, I'm getting down to the very, very fine details on this guy now. And then the base.
So I am super excited about that Mecha Meemaw. She looks like fun. And even if I never play her, that looks like a fun, fun, fun model to paint. Because crazy gremlin in a spider mech equals fun times. And it kind of reminds me of that uh, spider mech from – anyone remember that uh, – to be fair, it was kind of a terrible movie. But that movie, I think it was the late 90s, the uh, movie Wild Wild West. Oh, yeah, I found all those old uh, Ramos parts. Now that, you know, Ramos got, went and got himself arrested, and by God himself got arrested. It was not his fault. Well, it kind of was his fault, but... That's neither here nor there. Wrongfully accused. Free Ramos. Free Ramos. That's what I say. But I think that the uh, that mech just reminds me of Wild Wild West. <laughs> so I went back and watched that movie again recently because it was it was available streaming uh, somewhere, and quite frankly, um, it holds up about as well as you think it would, which is not very well at all. It is awful. But it's amazing. It's got Kenneth Branagh in it. Oh, my God. Will Smith turned down The Matrix to make that movie. Oh, my God. My condolences to Will Smith on that decision. I mean, you would think that movie would have been, you know, good because, I mean, it had Kevin Klein in it, who, amazing actor, had Kenneth Branagh, who is, quite frankly, one of the best actors alive today. And yet... 
Yeah, you know, to be fair, I don't think Will Fit Smith is hurting for money. Uh, he's done quite a few other successful things since then. All right, those boots look nice. All right. Now it's time to dot the eyes. There we go. Ted Levine. Why do I know that name? Oh my God! Was he the um, crazy gen, the crazy general in Wild Wild, the general with the uh, the ear trumpet? So I've never seen Monk. So. So he's the one. Oh my God! Uh, that's hilarious. So if you feel like playing a little bit, speaking of people in unexpected movies, if you feel like playing a little bit of um, uh, hi, uh, you know, hi, you know, ser searching through movies and stuff, I actually used to be a professional actor a lifetime, like, shoot, 11 years ago, 11 plus years ago. When I lived in Chicago, that's what I went to school for originally. And I was in in it, the the Dark Knight, that um, the Batman movie with uh, Heath Ledger. And I was in the Dark Knight. And if you can, you know, go hunt me. And I'm I'm visible. I'm on screen more than just a flash. I'm on screen for at least a second or two. If you can find where I was in the dark, oh, see, I wanted to see if you could find me. I'm playing, you know, hide and go seek. Playing, you know, uh, this is a game. Let's play a game. If you can find where I was in the dark night and happen to uh, come back to the stream, uh, the next time I stream is going to be on Thursday. If you can come back to the stream on Thursday and uh, tell me where I was in it, you will win all of the internet points. Yep, all of the internet points. So a hint. Yes, it was in Gotham, but you got to tell me what scene it was in. And a hint is that both Harvey Dent and Bruce Wayne are present in that scene.
Oh, yeah, I totally gave that away. Uh, you are, in fact, correct. But if you can find me, you get points. Now, the hard part of it is um, that was before I had a beard and I had hair back then. <laughs> So you can find, you know, me probably about 13 years younger with hair and no beard. We like to joke that uh, my hair retired and moved south to Florida. And to be fair, you know, it just kept growing down here. Uh, during the uh, pandemic, I just decided to grow up the beard because why not? I heard early on during the pandemic, they were talking about how either people needed to shave their beard or be able to braid it and tuck it up into a mask. I don't know. See, I didn't have a beard. I, honestly, it was up to about here at the start of the pandemic. So it's doubled in length over the pandemic. I um, grew it out specifically so that I can braid it to tuck it up into a mask. No, braid it into a man. Well, I don't think that would be uh, great for, fil you know, provide very good filtration. Yes, money is starting to look nice. All righty. So, okay, I got to do that scroll and do some final highlights on his face after the money. And then I may put a little. Uh... All right, there we go. Yeah, that's coming along. All right, let's put a little bit of new lights on that scroll there.
Oh, Kyle, we got a person. And you know what, Learguard? Now you never will. It's very sad. We're all we're all gonna be, you know, mourning that loss. <laughs> there we go. Well, you only get one shot, you lose it, you use it, you own it, you never let it go. Something about spaghetti. So my game store is very well lit. <laughs> the one I go to. So I don't go to dingy game stores. I like you no know, nice game stores that are uh that, that I don't feel uncomfortable going into. Well, the local game store I go to, um, Dragon's Lair Houston, is really nice. And they're getting ready to actually double their size to be the, – they're moving into a new location. It's going to be like two and a half times what they've got right now. But, yeah, so – I'm painting under a very bright all-around light here. You can kind of see on the little picture of my ugly mug here uh, that they've got the – I've got this uh, paint, this light arch here that effectively it's um, got LEDs, LED lights here, daylight LEDs um, that uh, go big arch here. So I'm getting light from all sides here. So you can see that it's very hard for me to actually put a shadow over this, which is really, really nice. And that means that when I, I photograph it under the same lights. So when I take photos, it looks really, really good here. This is going to be the best it's ever going to look. Um, and so I, if you're someone who takes pictures of their miniatures to post anywhere, I recommend uh, taking pictures of them under the light, well, painting with the lights you're going to be taking pictures with. It makes for better photos, and then uh, you don't run into weird photo artifacts or whatever. Oh, you've heard you've heard of Dragon? Yeah, they're really, really awesome. They were founded in, I think, San Antonio is where their first store was. But um, they've got two stores in San Antonio. One store over in Austin, and one store here in Houston. And they're just a really great store. Um, store the store over in Austin is where um, they'd run Malifaux tournaments in Austin for a long time. I run tournaments here at the uh, Houston one. And I don't know the owners of the other stores, but I'm um, good friends with the guy who runs the Houston store. He's been really good to the uh, Malifo community. But he's one of those guys who he's just wanted to uh, run a game store. Yeah, hard to paint you with the uh, light box. Uh, yeah, so I... I've moved away from using my um, diffuser box as much because these are re relatively um, – because it's lighting evenly all around. Uh, it works pretty decently for um, 
you know, painting under. Before I made this uh, light arch, which is something I um, designed, 3D printed, and then wired up. Um, I had a couple of lights from Ikea, but they were very directional. And so I had to put diffusers over them to really um, get good photos. I've got a nice, uh, I bought a nice um, photo backdrop from I think Macromance is the ones who made uh, Table Wars Macromance photo backdrop. So if you see, uh, if you go to my Instagram and check out any of my uh, finished pictures, the it's on these nice neoprene um, mats that you know provide a nice backdrop. I've got three backdrops: one that's a gradient white to blue one that's kind of a warm tone and one that's a cool tone. Lately, I've been mostly doing it on the warm tone just because it kind of highlights the minis I've been, paint, I've been posting on there. But painting under the lights that you're going to photograph under means that then you know what it's going to look like. And then I do uh, something I do occasionally do um, is that I will go, you know, take off my painting glass because these are all, these are just magnet. I don't. Um, I've got magical laser eyes. A couple years back, so these are just uh, magnifying glasses uh, that I bought at the local drugstore. But I'll sometimes I'll take and go and hold the um, model up just under the room light here, just to kind of see how it reads. And so I'm, you know, over here, you know, I'll hold up. Some, you know, go, stand here, look at it, see how it reads away from this the light I've got over here. And that really does help to know how it's going to look out in the real world. But ultimately, Your model's always going to look better on your painting table than in the real world because this is a controlled setting. But make it look as good as possible for where it's just, here's the thing. If it looks really good under this, when, you know, it's out at the game store and someone doesn't have magnifying glasses and the hyper intense light there, it should still look good. All righty, so you, I believe, all right, I'm going to do one of my, oh, I just need, he needs a little bit more on the red, just hitting that, clean that up just a bit. There we go. Yeah, and moving to a new place, uh, moving is always a pain, but it does give you that chance to get set up in a really nice, you know, office or something. You know, really set things up the way you want. I have a fish as of last week, and I have officially lived in Houston for ten years now. Woo! Okay, yeah. I'm digging this guy. He, uh, I'm gonna give him a little bit uh, more on his hair right there. There we go. 
But now I am going to do one of my favorite little painting tricks here. All right, so there he is. So I am actually going to move my paint palette aside here. Let's move this off to the side. Because what I'm going to do now actually isn't paint. I am grabbing. What these are is this is a Pigma Micron pen. And so this, this is one of those crazy little uh, tips that a friend told me about a couple years ago. These are uh, archival uh, waterproof inks. They're, you know, basically, they're kind of like Sharpie. They're permanent um, ink. But here's the thing is that is the size of the tip of the pen. So I use these and I've got, you know, a whole bunch of different colors. I use these for when I want to do like some text or highlighting or basically things that you would do with freehand a lot of times, but that even, you know, a number zero razor sharp brush isn't going to get. And so I intentionally, well, it's like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to do some stuff on these uh, dollar bills here, or these, uh, the script, the script here. And so this, this is, you know, so this is how tiny, I mean, I'm going to draw, draw this on my thumbnail right here. And you can see how fine of a line that is. So, yeah, uh, something I've done a lot is, like, I use the brown on, like, parchment, you know, like, doing writing on parchment or whatever. So this is one of those really, really cool tricks that a friend taught me a couple years ago. And as you can see, so uh, I did that on my thumbnail just to see there. It gets a nice permanent line on there. And because it's not so... Brush to, yeah, you can do this with a brush, but your paint has to be just right. And if you mess up, it'll go, and it's bad. So this is one of my favorite little tips. So now I am going to do a little bit of writing on, and it's been a little while since I did that, done this, and I have terrible handwriting, but I'm going to do a little bit of writing on his, and I'm just trying to make sure you can see this here, on those bills. And so it's hard to see there. But you can see I wrote a 10 on that one bill there. So is a great little way to write freehand stuff on there. Because trying to actually write with a paintbrush, just unless you are a master calligrapher, doesn't work out well. So this is one of my favorite little pointers for... putting writing onto a model. And well, you know, these are tiny little details on the uh, bills there. It, you know, the logic on what I'm actually writing on here, I'm just writing like 10 or 100 or various stuff like that on there. When it's, you know, held out at arm's length, people aren't going to notice that. But when they pick it up and look at it like this, it just really helps to make a cool model there. So he's going to have a $100 bill on his boot here.
So it's tiny little details. And you, uh, if you're doing this, you want to avoid touching that area for a little bit because it does take a little bit of time for it to dry. But then once it does, it's nice and permanent. And um, I learned this originally for when I was painting models from other companies that have got lots of scrolls and stuff all over them. Trying to actually write on those, it normally just looks like little dots and lines and stuff there. And with one of these, you can actually write words on them and it really helps to sell that. So, hey. Uh, so, and um, in case you want to know what they are, they are called Pigma Micron pens, and it's got a um, yeah, 0.2 millimeter thick line. So it's a very, very fine line. And you can get them in all, and so I'm using the black one there because I figured it gives a nice contrast against the money there. It's got green money with little white splotch there. And then, you know, if you actually look at American Bills, they've got a lot of that on there. But yeah, I've got um, them in green, purple, blue, red, and brown. Uh, a lot of times when I'm writing on parchment for very fantasy type things, I end up using the brown one a lot. But yeah. I hope you like that uh, that tip. This is one of my favorite ones that a friend taught me a couple years ago. I don't even remember who told me it. And the other tip I have when it comes to doing writing um, on a model is don't think of it as writing. Try to, if possible, and this usually is more important when you're doing like a large thing. This, it's tiny enough that, you know, it's, it's writing. But if you're going to be writing out, you know, a large sign or something, don't think of it as letters, because then it starts to look like your handwriting, just innately. Break it down into the shapes of the letters, and then block them in, not as you would actually write the word, but as you, it's like, oh, like if you think of it, a D is half of a circle with the middle cut out, with the middle blocked out there. A B is two of those stacked and figure out what the shapes are that make up the letters and then think of them not as letters think of them as shapes and it makes them look better as opposed to having a um your handwriting coming through because no matter how nicely i paint uh i've got garbage handwriting And also, I'm going in, and on the inside of this scroll here, I'm literally just kind of 
adding a couple dots there because then it reads like, oh, really fine writing on the inside of that there. Just a couple dots in there, nice little bit there. So I think he is, yeah. So I, I'm going to type, type this into the chat real fast in case anyone's wondering what they're called. These are called Pigma Micron Ends. Uh, you can you uh, I you can find them at most um, if you got a good art store near you most of them carry them uh, I think I ordered mine online I've had them for a long time now and they last for a very very long time so I hope you all uh, use this fun little tip because that's uh, an exciting little nugget I've been Thought of the, I literally thought of it when I was prepping up for the stream today for something that I wanted to share with you all. Now I'm going, because we've got about uh, 15 minutes left here, I think. Unless I'm going insane. Yeah, about 15 minutes left here. Um, I think the next model I'm going to be painting is I'm going to be doing Desper Laro. But I don't really have time to get them started on this here. So I'm going to get going on the base here. So let me find, all right, so my grays, there we go. Those are my grays. Let's grab my stormy gray. So one of the problems, so I did a zenithal prime on this guy and it kind of washes out a lot of the details uh, I mean, on the, the shadows on the base there. So I'm gonna go back and basically I'm making more or less a wash, kind of going in and toning it down. I'm gonna go really thin and paint the entire surface of this um, base with this. And so you can see on there, that's very, very thin down. I'm basically, it's, it's like a wash here, but I'm going with a gray. I'm doing that to kind of just add a little, get some of the detail that got washed out a little bit when I went and did the Zenithal Prime on this there. But I'm going with the gray and not the black because uh, black just would kind of then tone down. I don't want to get rid of all the zenithal details that I had on there, but I'd like to kind of pump them up a little bit more. dry in there. I'm just going to grab a sip of my tea. Mm. And I'm not actually going to paint the um, sewer grate with the metallics because let's be honest. Oh, uh, yes, I airbrushed the zenithal. Um, got my airbrush right here. Um, I use the Badger Steinal Res, so I use the uh, so I do the black, then I do the gray at about a forty-five degree angle, and then I do the white top down. Um, if you go back and look at the first, uh, I'm not sure how far back uh, Twitch saves the uh, videos or not, but the first video I did with um, on the Play Weird stream, was, I went over how I do Zenithal. So I do, you paint the entire model black, 
Then I go and do like a 45 degree angle downward with a gray. And then I do top down. And I don't actually go top down like that. I then tell the, one of the reasons I got the uh, handles here is I then go top down like this. So this is how this model was just done zenithal. So what I end up doing with um, when I do the zenithal is uh, so let me just make sure you can see me in the screen here. Do, 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 do. Sorry, just keep pulling it. So I kind of go, I go and I um, you know go in like this is how I end up doing it is I spin them around, and then when I do the top down, um, I kind of then it's not one hundred percent top down. And then a lot of times I will then go and do it a little bit obliquely on a uh, area of in on areas of interest. So the face is going to end up a little bit uh, lighter there. Or if there's a bunch of details on the inside of a cloak that isn't um, total that the zenithal didn't get, I'll kind of go and I'll spray across them to really just kind of pick up the edges on them there. So, like, uh, if you take a look at Desper Laro, who I'm going to be painting this guy next to him, is if you take a look at it, his face there is um, semi, you know, zenithal. But if it were only really getting him top down with white, he wouldn't have gotten any on his face there. So I kind of went back in and cheated in with the white to uh, bring that highlight to faces are always a focal point faces and weapons, and they'll get a little bit more, I'll, I'll cheat the zenithal a little bit. So it's not a truly zenithal there at times, but it, you know, close enough that it just, um, we're not going for full reality here, just mostly reality. Didn't do the gray middle step. Yeah, so I do black, I do the gray middle step, and then I do the what? So, it's crazy how much that gray middle stuff really, really helps grainy. Uh, yeah, I use, so I use a, um, the Badger Patriot 105. Um, I love this one. This is a workhorse brush. They are, uh, one of the things I really like about them is they're based in the US. So if something breaks on it, um, it's easy, it's cheap and easy to get a replacement part. And um, they're just really nice people. I like, uh, I like the uh, Badger people a lot. Plus they make a good airbrush. Ooh, three cards. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I airbrush right in here. Um, something that you can't really see is I've actually got set up on my, uh, cause just the angles here. I've got set up on my desktop here. I made my own little, um, air filter for it. And it's literally a, a box with a, um, like a 12 inch, uh, air filter that you just put in like your home air filters. And then, uh, put, attach a hose to the back of it and run that hose to a little uh, fan I've got underneath my desk. So it sucks any of the particulates out of the air, and I probably need to change the air filter out on it because it's um, mostly black now at this point. But it is a nice um, way to go. And I do that. I... Do I mean I do more than just priming with my airbrush? But if you only ever end up priming with your airbrush, if you live in a place, I mean, you live up in Seattle, I think you said. So I don't know what your hum. I know it's rainy up there, but I don't know how much humidity you get in the air. Down here, I live in Houston, which is. Pretty much always hot and humid. 
which means that priming outside is an a um, uh, it's just a lesson in frustration. Because quite frankly, if you ever try to do use white primer, um, you can actually get it with the humidity is wrong. It'll turn to fuzz and just gunk up a model. Uh, one of my local players here uh, recently did learn the hard way that um, priming with high humidity is a bad thing. And he, he had he tried to strip his models and ended up uh, just having to get entirely new models just because they were just so gunked up. So I am just going to now I ultimately when it comes to stones, dry brushing is the way to go. And so this is getting pretty close. I mean, the guy himself is done. I'm just going in, and I am doing his base now. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to paint the rim of the base. Um, I need to go back and dry brush uh, and do some little detailing on that um, sewer grate, the, the uh, sewer lid there. But uh, I painted that with a really, really thin paint, so it's going to take a little bit of time to dry. And I've not taken... Uh, Ash and old arts advice yet and gotten myself a hair dryer. I really need to do that at some point. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to paint the rim of the base. Now, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into the debate here on this too much, but I am of the opinion that, well, I know a lot of people paint their bases with the color of the faction. I don't like how that looks personally. I just go with a plain black rim on my bases because the um, philosophy I go by is 
This model's universe ends at the edge of that rim. And so I have the black void around it. And it really makes it pop in photos. And having a colored rim on a base fights your model for detail, for attention. And when I'm doing this, I also like to just keep going with the way, it's like painting a wall. So I'm just painting a big black, unthinned paint around the edge here. And you want it to be, you just paint with the wet edge. Because then it gives you a nice, we're going for thick coverage here. This is like the one time I use unthinned paint because I want to get nice thick coverage there. And it's the rim. But keeping with the um, wet edge helps to avoid brush strokes. So what I'm gonna, what I have left to do on this is I've got to go and basically add some uh, highlighting to that sewer grate. And then what I'm gonna do is, if you take a look at say, old Randall here, his base, some of the stones I'm just gonna go and hit them with a brown wash just to add some color variation to the stones there. So it doesn't look like all of the stones are exactly the same. And that, you know, helps to add a little, bring a little bit more interest to it. And make for a nice looking model. So I will uh, be finishing this guy up after the stream here. And I'm going to take some photos and uh, post them to my Instagram later on tonight. And yeah. So that is Counterfeit Kevin, all finished up there. Uh, yeah, thank you all for tuning in. Um, I took a, I made notes here for me to remind. So tune back in tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow noon Eastern, Eleanor is gonna be streaming and also Haunted Miniatures is gonna be streaming uh, 3.30 tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I'm Doug, uh, Top Doug Design on Instagram. If you want to see some photos of the finished miniatures here, uh, I'm also Guslato on Twitch. So I may later on tonight be doing a little streaming, uh, depending on if my D and D game gets canceled tonight or not. But yeah, thank you all for tuning in. I'll be back uh, painting on Thursday. I'm going to be painting up Desper Laroe. I'll be here Thursday at three o'clock Eastern. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Have a wonderful day. Stay weird, everyone.